um, I will hand it over to Mike. All right, thanks, Kaylin. Um, I just want to confirm you can see my screen and I'm coming through okay? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks, Kaylin, and, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, I know we've we've gone through lots of talks over the last 24 hours or so. So um, I hope I hope you're still as excited as you were, uh, you know, a day ago. Um, we've covered lots of information, and for me, anyways, it, it's just leading into building the excitement for the atlas even more. So the the session that I'm I'm giving right now is is on significant species. So hopefully that's what you were expecting. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, so the there is there's all these different committees uh, and working groups as part of the atlas, and one of them is this working group that's dealing with significant species. Um, the significant um, committee. Uh, we've got a group of folks from within the uh, the various atlas um, partners and as well as other uh, experts across the province on a rare and colonial species. So the presentation um, this afternoon is gonna be about 15 minutes. Um, we're gonna cover what is exactly a significant species, uh, why are they so important, how, why do we want you to document them, and how should you go about documenting them. So um, lots to cover, so I'm just gonna get going here. So a significant species, um, it's something that's identified by the ATLAS, by the Significant Species Committee. Um, so there's, there's three different types of significant species. There's provincially rare species, um, and they're identified on any ATLAS checklist you see, whether it's in hard copy or on your, your phone through the app or um, through the data entry Nature Counts website. Um, they're identified with that dagger icon. Then there's the regionally rare species, those are identified with that double dagger. And then there's the species of interest, which have that funny double S, um, that double S um, symbol. So the provincially rare stuff, um, these are the super rare things or um, you know things like endangered species, like this Henslow sparrow. Um, and so for these records, you're gonna get asked to provide details for any record breeding evidence attached to any level of breeding evidence. For regionally rare things, um, these are different depending on what region you're reporting your data in. So it could be something like a Swainson's thrush pictured here. Um, you know, in certain parts of the province, obviously, this would not be flagged as regionally rare. In large parts of the province, this is one of the most common birds you're going to find in the boreal forest, for instance. Uh, but if you recorded uh, a breeding Swainson's thrush in, say, southwestern Ontario, one of those regions, then it would be flagged as regionally rare, in which case you ask for or any record with any breeding evidence. The third type of significant species are the species of interest. And so these, rec these are species that could be something like a colonial species, like the great blue heron shown here, um, it could be more widespread uh, species at risk, something like eastern meadowlark, or it could be just uh, other species that we're particularly interested in. Um, you know, maybe we think there, or we know there's long-term declines or short-term declines, and we, we want to just get information. So for these species, you're only going to get um, added some details if you enter confirmed level breeding evidence. Now there are some other reasons that records that you enter into the atlas could get flagged or you could be asked for more information. Um, the first reason is it could trigger an eBird flag. So all of the data that comes into the atlas goes through um, what we call eBird filters. So these are filters that are, are, are brought in from eBird and they basically set a daily limit based on the location for every species. So if you enter uh, a high count at a time of the year where the species is common, it could get flagged if it's if it's a true rarity for the area it would get flagged um, or and also if it's out of season it could get flagged for that reason and the final reason that a record could be flagged upon data entry uh, it uses an unusual breeding code so you'll start to see these 
yellow and green exclamation points popping up when you start entering different breeding evidence codes for different species. These are species specific flags um, that are relate to that species biology that we give you some sorts of warning about using certain codes for certain species. So why are we even asking you to document significant species? So there's, there's two main reasons for this. Um, the first reason is to verify the record. So, um, you know, make sure that you identified it correctly. The second reason that we're asking you to document significant species is to get extra information about that record. So generally these species that are um, significant species are higher priority for conservation action. So they could be, uh, they could be rare species, they could be colonial species. Um, a lot of them are listed species at risk under either the either or both the federal or provincial um, species at risk act or endangered species act. So these species, they have a higher, we have sort of a higher standard or quality of data that we want to ensure we're collecting. Uh, and that extra detail can really go a long way for helping us um, enact conservation action um, by, by making sure we know them as much as possible about the, the distribution status um, of the species and sort of the quality of their breeding sites. And I can't understate or I can't overstate the importance of this information for, for rare species in particular when it comes to uh, properly conserving these species, their habitats and their populations. Sorry so to interrupt you, you here, Mike. So sorry, just one moment. Um, you're just breaking up occasionally. Of course, now that I've come on to let you know, it hasn't happened in a, in a few moments, but I just wanted to let you know in case you wanted to maybe try turning your video off or, or something. Sure, I'll try that. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, but please interrupt me if that happens again, Caitlin. Um, the joys of, of rural living. So. How are you going to document these significant species? So there's a lot of different elements that can go into a description or the documentation. So the good news for all of us is a lot of this information is automatically collected when you're entering the data. So things like the number of individuals, the date of the observation, all of that information, the breeding evidence code that you've used, all of that information you should be entering anyways for all records. So you're, you're sort of several steps ahead already. So the stuff you want to focus in, on when you're adding details for these flag records is things like description of the bird. So what you actually saw, how you identified it, what are some of the similar species that you're trying to eliminate uh, and how familiar you are with that species. It's also can be very helpful if you provide a description of the habitat uh, or even take a picture of the habitat that can, that can really help out as well. Um, there's lots of other things you can you can include, um, and, and and I'm gonna get into a little more detail shortly. So there is a simple significant species form. Um, there's a blank one and then a sample one filled out in the appendix K of the of the instruction manuals. That this is the appendix that deals with significant species. Um, so in this, uh, this is just a sample. You do not have to do it exactly this way. You can just scribble it in your notebook, or if you're using the app, you can enter it, um, type in the information um, right on your phone. And a lot of phones will even let you use voice to text um, to fill in the information. But in this example, um, we've got Johnny Cash, who's observed uh, tufted titmouse, which would have been a, a regionally rare species in this case. Um, so it's been flagged for details in, in that area. And he's provided some, some good background information about sort of the circumstances of the observation, um, as well as some field marks in terms of what he actually observed. Uh, and he made note that he's very familiar with the species from all of his time in Tennessee. So just a, there's, there are some samples that you can check out in the in Appendix K. There's a couple more from, from Johnny Cash, I believe. Now, if you're entering data on the website or through the app, um, the process kind of leads you along, so you don't need to remember everything you need to do. Um, in this in this example, I've entered a breeding evidence is a regionally rare species in the area. So, because I entered a breeding evidence code, it's popped up that little that red text up at the top, 
um, telling me that I need to document the species. So there's a little tech tick box that you've got to check to sort of confirm that you weren't just making a mistake with the data entry. And then you're encouraged to click on the uh, click on the add details box uh, right here. So if you click on the add details box, that will pop up this little window here. Um, and the first thing that, add, that you can add is the description. And so this is where you want to put information about, um, about how you identified the species, um, some, some of those things like similar species you considered, things like that. Um, so remember, there's two aspects to what we're, we're asking you to document. The first one is um, the identification and so that we can verify the record. Um, but we also are hoping to get as much extra detail, um, especially for the rarest things um, that you can put in here. So there is um, a spot, you, the keen-eyed people will have noticed this little spot for media files. Um, this box uh, is not active yet. We're hoping this becomes live sometime soon. Um, so at, at some point, you'll be able to click on this to upload your media files. So whether it's an audio recording or something like that. In the meantime, if you do, and we encourage you to collect that information, if you do capture some video or photos or audio, uh, you can just add a note in the description for now um, to let the person who is going to review your record know that you do have these extra media files to support the observation. Now, uh, sorry, I, I uh, clicked ahead too fast there. Now, the, the, last, the last thing to point out on this screen is that that middle option, the coordinates, if you click on that, that will take you to a map of the square and you'll be able to see where you've been if you have your track log on. Um, and you can toggle back and forth from the, the top of you to the saddle view. So if you've clicked on this, then this is where you can add the exact location of where that particular bird was. So if you just zoom in on the location and you can click on the map, it will fill in the latitude and longitude for that record. You can adjust the number of individuals at that point, and then you can add as many points as you want for that checklist for that species. So this is really important uh, um, for all species. We really want to get exact information for these uh, significant species. For something like the species of interest, um, you, you should focus your attention on, on this. Uh, you can probably put a little less detail in the uh, description. So just to kind of wrap things up, um, in terms of the significant species, um, we really want you to pay special attention to them. Uh, we want you to focus on and try to find as many as you can and document them as, as best as possible. It's really fun. I, I think it's one of my favorite parts of, of atlasing is, is trying to find um, these significant species and document them. The data is extra helpful. Um, it really goes a long way in terms of helping us conserve these rare or otherwise important species. Um, if you want to practice, you can practice taking good notes for common species uh, in your area. And please try to document your finds with photos, video, and audio, um, and share some of those with us. Um, if you're looking for more information, check out Appendix K. Um, that's the one that deals with how to, how to document this, uh, these significant species. And finally, uh, please talk to your regional coordinator if you do have questions about how to document a particular record. So with that, uh, I think we're, we've got our time for questions. I'm gonna end my show here. Perfect, thanks so much, Mike. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, some uh, Catherine asks, uh, what about species that are expanding their range northward in response to our changing climate? Are these regionally rare or will these be regionally rare? Okay, I'm sorry, Kaylin, can you repeat that? I was busy trying to readjust my screen. <laughs> no, absolutely, no worries at all. Um, what about species that are expanding their range northward in response to our, clean, our changing climate, sorry. Uh, are these going to be regionally rare? Uh, well, it depends on the species. So we have so the way those regionally rare species lists were were developed, um, we rely heavily on um, the Atlas II data, but we did also have to update that because in in the past twenty years there have been some pretty big changes um, 
you know, something like red-bellied woodpecker, for example, um, here in region 16, where I am in Peterborough, I think we had one square, maybe two squares of the whole region with any breeding evidence. And now it's, you know, in probably three quarters of the squares. So, um, you know, that's an example where we did definitely look at some things like eBird and other data sources to try to try to update those as best we could. So, you know, it wouldn't be a regionally rare species here. Um, there certainly will be options for us to adjust those lists throughout the five years if, if we're finding that stuff it aren't as rare as we thought they were, then we'll adjust accordingly. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question. I know that currently it's not possible to upload media files with the app, but do you know if that is planned for, for future iterations of it? Uh, I think it's on the sort of longer term wish list. Um, I, I, I think it won't be there this year. Um, maybe for next year. I, the, the goal is to get it up and running on the website first, kind of the way eBird works currently, where you can't upload stuff straight through the app. If you have photos or, or audio, you've got to then go to the website afterwards. So um, it's, on, it's on that wish list, but uh, we've got a lot on the wish list as, as you know, Caitlin. Yeah, definitely. Um... Okay, Angie's asking, there are cliff swallow nests on about a quarter of the buildings in my town. Do I need to document all of them? Yeah, good question. So, I mean, you don't have to do anything. Um, we would really like you to, do, to document um, all of your significant species finds. So if you can document all the cliff swallow colonies, that'd be awesome. Um, but nobody's like gonna fire you from doing Atlas data collection if, if, you, if you don't do every, everything, you know, to 100%. Okay, and I think um, that kind of answers a little bit of Jean's question too. She said if, um, if we're Alicing in an area where a particular significant species is pretty common, um, can the documentation be a little briefer if they keep showing up on a lot of our daily checklists? Yeah, yeah, and I didn't, I didn't cover that very well. So, um, the there's a couple of things, sort of principles of, of documenting these species. So one of the principles to keep in mind is, um, you know, the the amount of the amount of documentation you put in should sort of be rel relative to the significance of the record. So, um, you know, if it's the first breeding record of black-bellied whistling duck for the province, you should probably put a Put a pretty good amount of effort into the documentation you provide, um, you know. Versus if it's a meadow lark, eastern meadow lark, um, you know, we really for a species like that, if you're if it's a fairly regular occurrence in your area, we're we're just looking for locations, pretty much. Um, so, and if it's a species you've already documented at a particular site, you can you know refer back to the first time you documented it, things like that. Yeah, and additionally on the app, there is the option to add a specific location as well. Um, I know you showed that uh, in your um, Nature Counts portal version. I went over it briefly yesterday as well in, um, in my app demonstration for how to submit data. So I just did want to mention that as well. Um, okay, so someone is asking if I upload to eBird, will it go into Nature Counts when I transfer the list from eBird? Um, I know the answer to that is no. Um, but could they potentially add the link to that eBird checklist in the comments so that people can go to the checklist and view the media? Yeah, that's a that's yeah, that's a great way to do it. Um, if you're yeah, for 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 media, if you've uploaded it already to eBird, that's even better. I said you could put in the notes that you've that you have a photo, but if you have a link to where that photo or video or audio is already stored, then yeah, just put the link and it saves it saves everybody a couple steps. Perfect. Okay, we do have a few more questions and we have a bit more time. So um, someone is asking what constitutes a colony? I feel like that's a little open-ended. Constitutes a colony. Uh, I, I can't remember. Uh, Mike, Mike Cadman, you're on there, I think. Um, yeah, I don't remember the exact definition. For, for some species, we might have slightly different rules. If in doubt, document it. Um, Tyler is asking, what if private landowners do not want detailed locations of birds submitted for their properties beyond the 10 by 10 kilometer square? 
Yeah, I mean, we hope we're, we won't have to worry about that too many times, but, um, you know, I would say in that example, I would talk to the regional coordinator and, uh, and we'll figure out something in those sort of rare, rare cases. Perfect. I'm just looking through here a little bit more. Um, okie dokie. Oh, yeah, that's another one with the 10 by 10 kilometer square. So I'm just going to mark that as answered. Um, how should we determine which significant species to target? I have a rather low activity square with few rarities in past atlases. Yeah, well, there's a few a few things you can do. Um, so the first thing you do is go to the square summary sheet. So if you're on the Atlas website under uh, under tools and resources, uh, sorry, I'm I'm drawing a blank. Um, the square summary sheet. How do you get to it, Caitlin? Yeah, uh, if you go under tools and resource tools and resources, there should just be a um, square resources option on there um, and so if you click on square resources um, yeah it's the third one down and that will take you to a page where you can find the square um, i can potentially just share this um, where you can find the square that you're looking for um, so i'll just put in a random one um, and then you can download the the summary sheet from there Awesome, thanks. So yeah, on the on the square summary sheet, um, there is a column where it lists. I mean, it's it's where it lists the breed, highest breeding evidence for last atlas for any species. So you can use that as a as a quick first step to figure out what unusual, what significant species were there last time. Um, I'd highly recommend going checking out eBird. Um, so you'd need to narrow things down a bit in terms of which species you can look at species maps and and see which species are showing up on eBird. Um, from within the uh, within your square, those are those are two good ways. Um, I the other thing is I would chat with other atlasers in your area and find out what species they might be looking for. Maybe chat with your regional coordinator, um, and then if you have once you have some species in mind, then you can sort of narrow things down, looking at um, other places where those species have been found and sort of figuring out what, hab what habitat um, to focus in on for different species. Yeah, and we had a few questions about um, what appendices we're referring to or how to find them. And I just wanted to let you know that all of the, the manual and the appendices can both be found on the website um, under the instructions and forms option, uh, which is in tools and resources. I'll just put that in the chat. Um, yeah, all panelists and attendees. So yeah, the instructions and the appendices are, are all there. Um, okay, who has access to the records of where species have been documented? And I think that'll differ between rare and significant species and kind of other species, I'll say. Yeah, so um, one thing I didn't talk about here, it's, uh, I hope it would be a whole nother talk, but there is a subset of species and they're pretty much all significant species, but um, there is a subset of species that are listed the atlas. Those species, um, you can still see the data, but it's only available at a at the 10k square level. Um, for other species, you can see the location of the checklist on the species maps, um, so people can access that information at that level. Um, but all the all the like exact details and things like that, that would be available for the regional coordinators in terms of um, they're the ones that are going to do the first verification of the data, and then that that information would also be available to the the significant species committee who does sort of this, a secondary review. Um, and then at some point, uh, you know, there there is the option for people to request data through the nature count system, um, and and um, there would be sort of like a a data application process for accessing that information. And so is there a list of significant and colonial birds available in the significant species appendix? Uh, no, it would be too big. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, and it varies ba based on region. So, um, you know, a regionally rare species is only regionally rare in 
one region, not necessarily the other. So um, anytime you start a checklist, either in the Nature Counts app or on the Atlas website, you're able to see the checklist based on your area has those flags. There is also um, under the instructions and forms page under tools and resources, there are print printable Atlas data forms. Um, and that includes Atlas checklists for each region. Um, and that has, again, basically all the species, I think we, we didn't include some of the super rare stuff in each region, but um, there is a printable checklist and it's got the proper flags for each species based on the region. So you can access it that way. Yeah, plus you mentioned the, the square summary sheet as well. We'll have the flagging and um, at the very bottom of the square summary sheet, it says what each one means um, if you do forget. Um, so yeah, that is available there as well. Um, okay, we're almost out of time, but I guess we'll go with one more uh, question. If you're importing data from eBird checklist to um, Nature Counts, uh, it uploads only the species details from the eBird checklist in the details box. If you've included the coordinates in your details, do you need to manually transfer the coordinates to the coordinates box in Nature Counts? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you should. If, the, if you've put coordinates in the details in, in your eBird checklist, um, the problem with those is it's, it's just stored as text that way. So it's not really, it's, it's not easily gettable in terms of like a big database. So, you know, you can imagine if there's hundreds or thousands of records like that, it would, it would take a person manually copying them or else somebody would have to figure out a, like a computer way to lo to figure that out. And then you'd have to know that's what those particular things meant. So yes, please, please do use the, uh, the coordinates tool within nature counts or the app to plot the precise location um, for all the significant species, if you can. Perfect, thanks so much. And um, if a bird is really rare, how would you like us to balance getting higher breeding evidence codes versus disturbing the bird? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the the bird should always come first. Um, so if if you have any if, if you have any thoughts that you're going to be disturbing the species, and this really doesn't, this really isn't just for um, for rare species. This is for all species. You, you should you should leave the bird. I mean, if you you've detected the bird already, that's that's good. Um, we don't want you to be you know chasing a bird around through the bush trying to find a nest, and then you um, you know you step on the nest or something like that. So always put the birds first, um, especially for rare stuff, um, you know, uh, and, and we do have a good section on sort of atlasing ethics and, and things like that in one of the appendices too. Perfect, thanks so much. We're out of time. I see there is still a few more questions, um, but we do need to close this session down to open it back up again to start a meeting for the regional discussion. Um, but thank you very much, Mike, and to everyone who has come to participate. Uh, that was super informative, and I think we all learn a lot more about proper documentation. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys.